So I'm excited to talk to you about some of the recent events that's been going on in Andrews and Horitz and our interest in the intersection between software and biology. So first, a little bit about me. So I've spent the last 15 years as a professor at Stanford and also an entrepreneur in the Valley. And I've had the joy and luxury of being able to geek out on a wide range of topics from computer science to biology to physics and to chemistry. But really the parts that I've been very passionate about is at the intersection between what software and computer science can do in biology and healthcare. Uh, so one of the projects that I pioneered at Stanford was the Folding at Home Distributed Computing Project. So with Folding at Home, the idea was that when we started over 15 years ago in October of 2000, the idea was that we, computers could have a huge impact in biology, but really only if we had enough computer power. That there was so much promise and so much excitement, but really limited by, by the available computer power at the time. And so what we did then is that we actually got people to donate their computer power, and actually we created the most powerful supercomputer in the world. And actually, even in 2007, getting a Guinness World Record for the first supercomputer at a petaflop. And in many ways, the exciting thing about Folding at Home for me was that we were able to anticipate what would be interesting trends in the future. Because what was very doable for us then, but impossible otherwise, now becomes really quite routine as Moore's Law continues on. And then also on the entrepreneurial side, I've been involved in several startups. Um, one of the more recent ones, School of Bavir Biosciences, takes a lot of these concepts and applies it to therapeutics and infectious disease and immuno-oncology where we use computation to be able to very quickly identify new compounds, especially for drug repurposing, and to move within months or under a year from having nothing to something that's ready to go into phase two clinical trials. What I wanted to talk to you about today, though, was, is this particular trend that we've been observing, uh, which we call Bio 2.0. And this trend is comprised of a confluence of many things that have come together, really at this very unique point in time. So first off is a trend that I was alluding to before, which is Moore's Law. I think everyone's familiar with Moore's Law, the fact that the cost of compute has been exponentially decreasing over time. You know, but what's intriguing about exponential decreases is that they really catch us off guard. That 10 years of exponential decrease can turn what used to be extraordinary into something that really is ordinary or commonplace or even free. So to put in perspective, for example, with Folding at Home, we got this Guinness World Record in 2007 uh, for the most powerful computer in the world. And now that same amount of compute power is just $300 a day on Amazon. And so that's really the amazing thing. It's just, you know, eight years, uh, and it goes from being sort of world-class, world-breaking, record-breaking, to something that is achievable by everybody. And what's interesting is that there's not just one sort of Moore's Law type of law. In a sense, there's sort of a family of laws. It's not just that the cost of compute is going to zero, but also other things, like uh, the cost of storage is going to zero, and also, also the cost of mobile is going to zero. Uh, right now in China, there are mobile phones that cost basically $20 that are as comparable in power to the original iPhone. And the interesting thing about this is that when we think about mobile, this is a huge infrastructure that didn't exist before, essentially a little supercomputer that's in everyone's pockets right now that's connected. And as we'll talk about, that enables really new types of uh, opportunities uh, and, and, uh, and new companies will arise from this. And finally, the, actually one aspect that's maybe a little underappreciated is that the cost of mobile going to zero has another implication, which is that there's all these associated parts with mobile that are part of the mobile supply chain that also come along the ride for free. So you know, all the cameras, the, uh, the motion sensors, and all those types of things, these things can be put into other types of devices. And what we're seeing is that a lot of the interesting hardware comes about by taking advantage of the mobile supply chain, things that are already there, and just slicing and dicing them in new ways. Well, so what's intriguing about this is that I've been talking about Moore's Law, and we might be tempted to say, well, this is just a computer thing, right? This is not really related to biology. But what I think is intriguing is that there are biological equivalents to Moore's Law. For instance, the cost of genome sequencing has been um, dropping dramatically. Actually, the interesting thing is it's not exactly dropping like Moore's Law. It's actually dropping to zero faster than Moore's Law. And you know, what does this mean? Well, it means that the extraordinary is now cheap. So the first human genome is $3 billion in 1997. Nowadays, the cost of goods is probably about $300, and I think we're going to see that moving to $30. And so again, what used to be like mind-blowing, amazing, like we could only do this once, becomes everyday cheap free. 
And so it's interesting to think what happens when we put all these things together. The cost of compute going to zero, cost of mobile, cost of storage going to zero, the sensors and all that stuff from the supply chain. And also the fact that in many areas of biology, the cost of these interesting biology areas are going to zero. You put this together and this is a confluence of events that has the opportunity to disrupt certain aspects of traditional biotech. I want to make it clear that it's not my claim that this will disrupt everything in biotech and there's many things that are very challenging and difficult problems in biotech. But there's an interesting opportunity here that I'll elaborate in the rest of my talk. And so when we start to see what happens with these macro trends, we're starting to see startups that have a certain uh, composition. And so first off is that we're seeing a lot of startups that are in the bio and healthcare space, but the key thing is that these are actually intrinsically software companies. They have software at their heart. And that often means that they have um, interesting machine learning and cloud computing, and they operate like software companies. A second area, which I'll elaborate on in a little bit, is the area of what I call cloud biology. And so what cloud biology is, is the opportunity to do real life biology experiments, but in the way that um, we typically think about calculations in the cloud. So let me put it this way, is that think about like the early days of startups and software. You'd have to build out this huge server farm, which cost maybe $20 million or something like that, before you could do anything at scale. And now with cloud computing, you can actually go to Amazon or Google Cloud, and with basically a laptop, electricity, uh, Wi-Fi, and a credit card, you could build a product and build it out to scale. And the intriguing thing is that it's not just that you don't have to build out this $20 million server farm before you know if this works. You actually also have the elasticity that you can use just as you need it. And also, very, very light touch, that the fact that you can do this with a laptop and credit card means that you don't have to go through a complicated business debt procedure or anything like that. Compare that to biology right now. You can outsource biology and chemistry as you would in a biotech regime. But right now, before cloud biology, this was a very high touch operation. It's not a laptop and a credit card operation. What cloud biology does is that it creates something analogous to cloud computing. But instead of computers in the cloud, these are typically robots or sensors or other types of devices that run real life biology experiments. And so what's intriguing about this is that we would get the same types of properties that you'd get from cloud computing for computing as you would for cloud biology for biology. And finally, another area that comes up over and over again in these new startups is new approaches to handling FDA risk. And so traditional biotech has to go through a traditional path of dealing with um, clinical trials and, and, and so on. And we're seeing a lot of companies that are taking alternate approaches whether that means going after non-clinical indications but clinical associations or other approaches, I think handling the FDA in different ways is an aspect of this trend that we're seeing amongst these companies. And so in a sense, I think when you look at all the parts together, to me, when I uh, see this picture, biology today reminds me of software in 20, 2005 that the opportunities are there and that what we expect to see over the next 10 years is an explosion akin to the explosion we saw in software 10 years ago. Okay, so th that's sort of the backstory and the big picture trend. Now it's interesting to think, well, what does this mean? What would you expect to see? And so there's a couple implications. So first off is that machine learning is starting to become very pervasive. And a great example of this is deep learning. The issue with machine learning before was that, before something like deep learning, is that a machine learning was sort of held hostage to one's ability to come up with the right features. In a sense, you almost have to know the answer to the problem before you can have machine learning solve the problem for you. And one of the seminal papers by Jeff Dean and Andrew Yang and co-workers was applying machine learning, and especially deep learning, to YouTube videos. So what happens in uh, deep learning is that we have this complicated set of one neural net feeding into another, feeding into another. And when you put YouTube videos at the left hand here, what happens is that along the way you start building up features such that the human being doesn't have to come up with the answer to featureize things. The deep learning algorithm do it by itself. And so in the case of videos, they'd be like low level geometric features. But the intriguing things is that other things pop up automatically, like this face. There are a lot of faces in YouTube videos, of course. And this becomes something that gets automatically identified. And what's intriguing, of course, is since this is YouTube videos, we know there's really one primary purpose for all videos on the internet, which is cats. And so, of course, the cats show up as well, uh, as they must. Okay, but this is YouTube videos into deep learning. What does this look like for biology? Well, for biology, you can imagine, like, let's say, 
in the case of drug design, maybe the low-level things are deciding what would be drug-like or not drug-like, and high-order things would be whether it's GPCR agonist or a kinase inhibitor or so on. And this could be anything. This could even be, let's say, applying radiology and being able to tell whether this is a tumor or not, or looking at pathology. Anything that's either visual or data-heavy, genomics, for example, our very natural approach is to be put into these types of um, uh, processes. And so what's emerging is due to all the advances in machine learning that come from the fact that we finally have the compute power. And you could argue that this architecture was first invented 20 years ago to some extent. But what we didn't have was the compute power or the storage to be able to really take advantage of this. I think we're at a unique period in time due to these macro trends. Uh, that this becomes viable. It's becoming viable in areas outside health and biology, but it's a very natural pairing for health and biology where there's such a magnitude of data and a great need. There's a second aspect that is starting to emerge, and, and this is from, I don't know if you guys remember this uh, commercial from uh, maybe a decade or more ago where, you know, the Reese's peanut butter cups, you got your peanut butter uh, uh, mixed in my chocolate. In my mind here, uh, the peanut butter are the people working in biology and healthcare, and the chocolate's the computer scientists. And if you prefer, you could think of it the other way around it. It still works. Um, and so the idea is that we see some companies where the two are separate or the biology guys would come up with the genomics and hand it over to computer science guys. And the successful companies that we're seeing these days are the ones where the founders can really go full stack in the biology and the computer science. And this is actually a very different situation than it was 20 years ago. I think the biologists are very um, familiar with computer science in a way that they really weren't 20 years ago, and that the computer scientists have a, almost like a kinship and a draw to biology, almost like biology is like the programming of nature of sorts. And so this ability to go full stack, I think, is present in the companies that we see that really can have the biggest impact. The companies that seem to have a sort of more average impact are ones that just sort of take the genomics out of the box, the machine learning out of the box, and run it. Uh, those are the companies I think will do well, but not the ones that will be growing big. And finally, I think the part that intrigues us and gets us excited is the idea that we can do things finally from a much more rational point of view. And again, this might not be true for everything immediately, but as time goes on, there'll be much more engineering versus empiricism. And so a great example here is this Bay Bridge. Uh, for those of you that, are, um, that don't live in the Bay Area, this is a bridge that's relatively new. Um, it was built due to earthquake issues. You can see the old bridge right behind it. And when this bridge was built, it cost pretty much the same amount as what a drug would cost, about $3 billion. And you can imagine if we didn't understand how to engineer bridges, it would be kind of a seeming disaster. Like, imagine, like, we had some idea and we built the bridge, and then we'd have to do clinical trials on the bridge. You know, so we would send mice over the bridge to see if it's safe first, and then we'd send people who really, really want to get to Oakland would go over the bridge. <laughs> uh, and, and then maybe it would get past regulations and then people go over the bridge. So it's ridiculous, right? And that's the same way that does seem absurd is the way that I think 10 years from now or 20 years from now uh, that many aspects of the way that we do things now will seem so antiquated. And that's because we finally have the, the power both in terms of computers and algorithms and data to be able to tackle this in a much more engineering-like approach. Okay, so let's summarize this. And maybe one way to summarize this is uh, from a table that's actually in Peter Thiel's book, Zero to One. And so he spends some time talking about why he loves software startups and hates biotech startups. And he makes a pretty uh, powerful case that biotech startups involve uncontrollable organisms and software startups involve just code, which is, can be uh, perfectly understood. Um, you know, issues of being heavily regulated versus unregulated, expensive versus cheap, uh, and so on. But what we're starting to see is that these new generation of bio and healthcare startups really look like software startups. In all the ways that we love software startups, these startups, even though they're in the bio and healthcare space, work like software startups. And that, I think, is part of what we think is the great opportunity here. So finally, uh, this is interesting to compare to the sort of traditional biotech approach. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the term Eroom's Law, anyone? Uh, familiar? Some of you. So for those of you who haven't heard of Eroom's Law, this was something that came up in uh, Nature a few years ago. And Eroom is the word more, as in Gordon Moore, spelled backwards. And the reason why it's more spelled backwards is that it's Moore's Law backwards that the cost of a drug, instead of exponentially decreasing over time, is exponentially increasing over time. And this is something that's been borne out for several decades now. And 
it's kind of clear why this is. In a sense, there's, just like I mentioned, siblings to Moore's law, there's uh, such as storage and bandwidth and, and compute and genomics. There's siblings to Ewum's law, like the cost of college tuition is also exponentially increasing. And in a sense, the reason why Ewum's, ex Ewum's law exists is basically people like us, um, well-paid um, yeah, professionals that are highly skilled, highly trained, and therefore very expensive and, and, and increasing at this exponential rate. And so when we look at the companies that we're excited about, about this uh, Bio 2.0 trend, you know, in a nutshell, which is maybe the crudest way to put it, you know, Ewum's law and everything associated with that are things where I know what the future of that looks like. I know what time goes to infinity looks like there, and it looks very, very expensive. And Moore's law, I also know what this looks like. And so we're really especially looking for companies that live in the Ewum's law space in terms of what their applications are, but that can take advantage of the Moore's law curves. And even if those companies are break even with standard technology today, it's very clear what the futures of those two companies would be. Okay, so I've been talking, you know, very sort of abstractly in some ways. And in the remaining time, I want to talk about some specifics to sort of put some meat around this and to go over some case studies. So there's three areas that come to mind to sort of demonstrate this thesis. Uh, the first is in terms of traditional therapeutics. And you know, we are really all familiar with these issues, the issues that they're very slow to develop, they're expensive, you have to deal with toxicity, and are naturally highly regulated because of those issues. And what's emerging now is a new type of therapeutic, uh, and a so-called digital therapeutic, involved with digital health. And so here, um, there's a portfolio company of ours, Omada Health, which I think is, is pioneering the area of digital therapies and digital health for um, pre-diabetics. And the idea here is that there's many issues in modern medicine that modern medicine does well, such as, you know, if I have a bacterial infection, if I didn't take an antibiotic, maybe I'm dead in two weeks if it's a serious infection. I take a pill and I'm magically better in two weeks. I mean, that's the power of modern medicine, which is really wonderful. And that approach works for some things, but it really doesn't work for others. Um, and I think what we'll find when we think about this maybe 20 years in the future looking back is that there are many areas for which the pill solution at least shouldn't be plan A. And these are the areas of behavioral solutions, issues like uh, pre-diabetics, depression, anxiety, sleeping disorder. You can imagine like the, the standard medical model works really well for something like an antibiotic. You can have a great mouse model for antibiotic. I don't think you can have a great mouse model for PTSD. Or, or, for, or for anxiety, or for even necessarily for type 2 diabetes, because the way we have type 2 diabetes would be very different from the way a mouse would have it. And so what's intriguing is that this whole area of digital health takes existing therapies that are often found in places like Stanford or UCSF, and that work, and these are behavioral therapies, but they're typically very expensive and available to only a few people. Like the Stanford Sleep Center, it does amazing things, but maybe 20, 30 people will be able to access it a year and it costs $5,000 a year. What companies like Omada does in the area of digital health is they take an existing, digital ther di existing behavioral therapy and they allow it to scale. Instead of tens of people, this in principle could be tens of millions or really hundreds of millions. And instead of thousands of dollars, this becomes hundreds of dollars. So how is this possible? Well, it's possible because of the huge built-in infrastructure we have with mobile already. And since you know, um, so much of this issue is, in a sense, could be solved by just saying, you know, your doctor gives you the talk when you're getting to, towards type 2 diabetes, the talk is you should exercise and eat better, and that should be the cure to type 2 diabetes. But it, that really doesn't work, um, at least for most people. And so with these behavioral therapies, due to a combination of tightly knit social and coaches and, 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 uh, and email and analytics, including things like scales, um, Oman has been able to come up with a full package that really transforms one's uh, behavior um, using this built-in resources. And Amada is not the only example. I think we're seeing many, many companies in this space um, in areas of anxiety, depression, PTSD, sleep, and so on. So the second aspect of these companies, which I think are intriguing, is that they have not just the claim that this could help, but because they can monitor things quantitatively, they can do the equivalent of things like clinical trials. And so you could compare a placebo, which is your doctor talking to you, versus a leading drug in the space for type 2 diabetes, metformin, uh, versus the lifestyle effect. And actually, if you look at um, which one works the best, which is closest to, uh, to zero, least number of people getting the issue, this lifestyle approach, the modern approach, actually can have greater efficacy. 
than the leading drug in the space. I think that's the hope here. The hope is not just, well, it's comparable to a drug in efficacy, but it can actually exceed the drug in efficacy. And then on top of that, obviously this doesn't have the toxicity issues that a drug would have. Now, going down the line, you can imagine very interesting things where you could combine a digital therapeutic with a, with a, a small molecule therapeutic uh, for synergistic effects and new types of cocktails. And that's more in the future. But even today, I think my recommendation would be something like this, be the plan A and the drug be the plan B. Okay, so, so that's one area of digital thera therapeutic and digital health. A second area that we're seeing is the area of cloud biology. And it's interesting to compare cloud biology to traditional biology. You know, if you went to any lab, like in Berkeley or UCSF or Stanford today, and you went to a top lab in biology, it would look pretty much like this. It's like teams and teams of people working with their hands, pipetting and so on. If you think about it, it's almost like a scene out of uh, pre-industrial revolution times, except for the computers and stuff. But in terms of like the manual labor, and there's reasons why manual labor has challenges. It leads to all these irreproducibility problems that we see. This is actually a, a true story from one of my colleagues uh, was telling me at Stanford a, a few months ago is that they were trying to track down an experiment that was extremely variable. And they didn't know why sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't work. And they were like going crazy and they were pulling out the hair for what it could be. And they finally, and so they started recording literally everything, what people were wearing, even like the dyes and lab coats can vary and can lead to differences. And they tracked it down to particular Tuesdays, one of the grad students had tuna fish sandwiches for lunch, and the amides from the tuna fish sandwich um, was getting into the material and, and, and causing some contamination. And something like that is like sort of insane to imagine tracking down, but it's a very common thing. You could imagine comparing that to the area of cloud biology where robots are driving everything and where the research is not about pipetting, it's about programming. You, write, you literally write a program that gets executed on the robots to, to do the experiment. Reproducibility looks like rerunning the program. And in this sense, can be completely, perfectly re reproducible. So Council is a company that um, I, I've been an advisor of, and they have a large cloud computing back end, a cloud, sorry, cloud biology back end, but there's several other companies like Emerald Therapeutics and Transcriptic uh, and, and Mousera that are applying these technologies uh, to be able to make this available broadly to other people. Okay, so finally, the third area that I want to highlight is an area of where traditional medicine is getting overloaded with data. And so this could be in radiology, dermatology, and genomics, and in, in cancer therapeutics. And really, it's, this data challenge is a huge challenge for a human being, but it's actually something um, very natural for, for data science and, and machine learning. I know uh, one of my favorite examples of this is in cancer, that you know, often we say that researchers throughout the world are looking for a cure to cancer. But ironically, that's actually completely false in the sense that we ha the problem isn't that we don't have a cure to cancer. Often the problem is that we have many cures to cancer. And the challenge is, what is the right drug for the right patient at the right time? Often, even if you get the right drug in the beginning, the tumor can, can metastasize or change and go through mutations. And suddenly that's no longer the right therapeutic. And so this challenge of matching drug to patient is a very difficult one for an oncologist to do, even amongst the best oncologists. And is a very natural one for, for uh, machine learning and genomics. And so in this space, we're starting to see a large combination of companies, uh, co companies that involve a combination of deep machine learning with genomics such that they can be able to understand individual patients in ways that really weren't uh, possible before. And maybe one last point about that is that uh, one thing that I think is poorly appreciated is that the quality of care throughout the country for something like oncology differs very greatly, whether you're at a, a, a landmark place or, or a small clinic. And the ability to drive this computationally isn't just increasing the care or decreasing the cost, but it's also bringing the highest quality care to everybody. Okay, so finally, let me wrap up and talk about, you know, what are the implications for this and what does this all mean? So there's one last uh, sort of Moore's Law uh, sort of sibling that I think is interesting. And while it's not completely directly related to what I'm talking about, I think it makes an interesting point. So this last one I wanted to talk about is actually the adoption of solar energy in the world. So this is an example of something that's sneaking up on us. For instance, the amount of solar power that's used in the world, a fraction of solar power in the world, has been increasing exponentially um, um, for several decades and doubles every seven years. So it's intriguing and is basically like 5% right now. It's intriguing to think what 20 years from now will look like. 20 years from now will be basically three doublings, so a factor of eight. 
And so eight times five is five is 40. So roughly half of the world's power would be provided by solar energy if this trend continues. And I think there's no reason to think that it wouldn't. And think about the impact of that right now, just like the cost of oil is decreasing just due to slightly less use of oil. Um, it's interesting to consider that it, it sounds like science fiction, but it's not impossible to imagine that 20 years from now, the cost of energy itself will also go to zero or, or start, start to, certainly start its way there. And that just feels like a science fiction kind of statement and something that you know, certainly remains to be proven, but it's an example of how transformative an exponential decay, decay in cost can be for just even 20 years, how much the world can change. It doesn't even have to be 20 years, it could be 10 years. My favorite example is that uh, uh, I'm very much addicted to using my phone for everything that I do and I don't think, I, could, I, I literally couldn't do my job without it. And I think that's true for many of us. I couldn't have gotten here, uh, I, got, I came over on a lift and I couldn't have gotten here, I couldn't have done my email, I couldn't have done anything. I can't even use two-factor authentication without it. You know, so it's really something that has snuck up on us and it's only been less, say, less than 10 years since the iPhone was even developed. And so what I'm intrigued about is due to this confluence of events, the cost of compute, cost of mobile, cost of storage, and cost of genomics, it will really create a, a different world that will sneak up on us very quickly. And that the companies that can take advantage of these Moore's Law curves and switch things from Ewan's Law over to Moore's Law will be the ones that are shaping that future. Okay, so with that, I'd like to thank you, and I think we have like three minutes left for questions. Thank you very much. You have a question? Q&A? Yeah, please. Anybody out there? Got to have a couple questions. Anybody? Nope. Here we go. Thinking about your time at Stanford and as, a, as a professor and then moving into the space you're in now, um, projecting, I mean, you, you mentioned that Ibram's uh, law of education being one. Uh, I understand Google is going to be coming up with a PhD program. How do you see um, education, you know, trying to, to educate or identify and educate new engineers that are also geneticists yeah. and combining those and who's going to survive that? Yeah, it's intriguing to think about these types of things. I think the challenge for education is twofold. It's education versus a training. And so it's, in my mind, education, a true education is learning how to learn. And if you can do that, you can be a computer scientist and you can pick up a biology textbook or you could be a biologist and you can pick up a Bayesian statistics textbook and you can sort of start to absorb it. But then also there's the training aspect just because once they get out, they have to be able to dive into things. And so I fully expect that we're gonna see a lot of alternatives to the university system for a variety of reasons. And I think that's actually very exciting. Um, if you think about it that right now there's sort of a limit to what universities can do that you know, Stanford can admit thousands of undergrads but can't admit millions of undergrads. And what can we do to scale these things? Um, MOOCs were a, an attempt, I think, will play a role in this, but it's interesting to think what else we can do, especially since Stanford can educate thousands a year when there's billions to educate, and, and that's the challenge. Can you hear me if I just ask a question like this? Yeah. Okay. Uh, we work in trying to find labs Yeah, so the question is, what does the lab of the future look like? And I think there will be much more automation, I think, and we're seeing that already just as a, a general trend. And the automation is both in terms of cost, but also I think the reproducibility issue is, I think, poorly appreciated. That um, basically, uh, if, and this has been highlighted in various journals, that most of biology coming out of uh, studies are not reproducible. And there's a variety of reasons for that. Some are statistical, such as the low p-value threshold. But even beyond that, it is just very difficult to do these experiments. And the ability to have it automated really just takes that all away and allows us to share protocols and share code. And you can imagine just as code sharing allows software to sort of be more than the sum of the parts and to extend and people copy, paste, edit, and modify, I can imagine that we'll see that as well. Now, it won't be something where it would be hard to completely automate all of it, but even a small degree of automation for the more repetitive tasks and challenging tasks, that alone probably even like 30% of the automation could handle 90% of the challenges. Right. One more question. Uh, 
Uh, Jashan Jackson from the Entrepreneurship Center over at UCSF. I just have a quick question about how does this translate into leveling the playing field for when you're trying to decide for these biotech startups versus some of these software companies? What, what do you think that this computational power, how do you think that translates to dollars for startups getting off the ground a lot quicker and faster? Yeah, I think where this translates is the idea that right now on the software side, we could give a bunch of uh, smart grad students or young entrepreneurs um, $3 million and they can use that with cloud computing and so on and get to a product. And then at later stages of investment, we can assess how that product is selling, how they're building up the sales. And basically at each stage, we can um, think about funding based on data-driven metrics of their performance, which is very different than biotech where you only have revenue at the very end and it's very difficult to de-risk in those ways. I think this levels the playing field in the sense that we're going to see bio startups that can be invested uh, in and raise money like these software companies where along the way they'll be able to move much more quickly to a product and improve the concept and even potentially to revenue very early. And that, that's something that would be very key to the health of the company but also to the de-risking of the company going forward. Great. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.